No, really, but thank you all for coming, and really thanks to the, to the, uh, to the foundation for, for putting on what is, again, a, a fantastic, uh, fantastic conference. So uh, Dr. Herder and I are going to be talking about some of the um, less desirable things to talk about, but very necessary, sort of, uh, we're affectionately calling it the dark side, but really things that we all think about, <laughs> things that we all might internally struggle with, uh, things that we are sometimes afraid to ask or talk about. Uh, we're going to try and provide a pretty good question and answer period because undoubtedly this will stimulate, um, stimulate a, bit of a bit of a conversation. So really my half is we're talking about the proper feeding of beautiful people, okay? And I don't mean just mean all of you, okay? <laughs> but <laughs> I do mean our, our patients and sometimes uh, other folks as well. So who am I? For those of you that know me, I'm very sorry. I'll apologize now. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm a direct primary care doc in Maine. Uh, I'm the chief cook, bottle washer, sea level this, sea level that. My wonderful wife is back there. Just raise your hand and act like you don't mind being, <laughs> act like you don't mind being seen in public with me. Um, additionally, uh, Dr. Mike Champy, Dr. Brian Pierce, and I uh, started uh, what, I, what we believe is the first regional alliance. Uh, which is in New England. So those of you who don't know England, we rule. And uh, let me think about this for a moment. Yes, we have a World Champion, World Series Championship team. So all of you from, all of you from, Houston and LA and uh, suck it up. <laughs> oh, well, you gotta give it. A, you gotta, you gotta let someone else win once in a while. But anyway, and I'm also one of the founding members of our national group, the Direct Primary Care Alliance. And I'll just make a little pitch. If you haven't joined, I'm not sure why you haven't. Um, but we got a booth downstairs. We're really growing uh, massively beyond all of our expectations. And so please feel free to sign up online. You get a t-shirt, pin, marker. I think we might be out of some of the temporary tattoos because Nick has got like six on his back <laughs> or something. <laughs> and really, um, I love what I do, but what my real desire in life is, is to, well, a couple of things. Number one, I want to be Yoda, okay? I'm going to be very clear about that. I want to be Yoda, and I want to be a rock star, okay? I want to blare my guitar, screaming, people, et cetera, et cetera. Some personal things about me, I like earth tones. Um, I'm kind of undecided on my, my favorite number. It used to be seven, but that's uh, become a little too, you know, passe. Uh, I do enjoy the mud, uh, obstacle course racing and things. And like every intelligent person in the world, I am a diehard Star Wars fan. <laughs> Absolutely diehard. So a little bit of a disclosure. I have no financial interest in the foundation. I'm not getting paid. I would... They'd be stupid to pay me to do this because I'm really not worth it. But I have no, I, <laughs> I have no, I have no financial ties to this. I did want to start out with a, a very pivotal quote. If you would give me the liberty to do so, it kind of reminds me of where I used to be and where some of you used to be and where some of you might even still be in trying to break free. It's a, it's, it's, uh, it's really an ode um, put forth several years ago, deep philosophical meaning, put together by some, some just great. Uh, you know, spiritual leaders. And it starts like this. I've listened to preachers. I've listened to fools. I've watched all the dropouts who make their own rules. One person conditioned to rule and control. The media sells it and you live the role. Anyone know where that came from? It's Crazy Train by Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> but I thought about that. That's right. No, I thought about that a bit. I'm like, you know, that's kind of where a lot of us either were or are were we're stuck on this crazy train and we've got a lot of a lot of entities that are telling us just assume your role which is sometimes bent over but assume your role okay and just do as you're told and do as you're told with regard to practice do as you're told with regard to a litany of of uh, acronyms et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. so i thought it really ran true we are trying to break free from this crazy train amen amen, amen. all right so the first thing to keep in mind is that it's not all about you, okay? We as physicians are tender-hearted, we're giving, we want, we want to be compassionate, we want to help patients, we want to help everyone who comes in to seek our medical advice and direction, but in reality, it's really not all about us. There are some crazy people out there, and I think some of them are in the room today, but there are some, there are some folks that can be very 
difficult to, to navigate and manage. And it's a very important thing to remember. You're gonna hear kind of a common thread, like it's, not, it's really, uh, it behooves us to have appropriate boundaries. And we have to keep in mind that we are humans as well. And that we're not just cesspools that people can suck off. Or the reclaimed water, I think, was out in the, uh, in the front yard. I'm not really entirely sure what reclaimed water is, but I think that's what they drink in New York. Um, so I'm going to talk about a handful of, of kind of patient archetypes in a way. Uh, a lot of people have done this in the past. I'm kind of putting my own little spin on things. So if I've missed a category, please don't take any offense to it. Uh, these are just some things that I, that I, I kind of put together. And the first that I want to talk about are, are what I call the dependents. These are the people who are really high praisers, they, they flatter you with you know, flowers and gifts, and at the same time, they can be very demanding. They can be demanding that they need to have a special number and a special email to contact you, that they somehow have a self-appointed position that's different than the rest of humanity. And that, <laughs> okay? And by the way, they're, I'm paying you for this membership. So there's a sense of entitlement that they deserve for us to come by and make their coffee in the morning or fluff their pillow or to spread the butter on the popcorn or things of that nature. I'm sure you're already getting, kind of getting a mental picture of who some of these people might be. It can be caused by their, their confusion as to what the patient-physician relationship is. They might feel as though you have more than just a patient-physician relationship invested with them. They may have, they may feel as though you have a personal interest in them, like they're your friend, or you want to go to the movies with them, or you want to go walk in the park, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. It can be somewhat difficult to really communicate with these folks, so it's important to keep the discussions focused, very professional, redirecting to the problems that they're coming in for and to try and, and give an appropriate buffered boundary between the professional relationship and their potential perception that this is something more than just a doctor and a patient. Firm boundaries and of course staying calm because some of these folks can drive us bat you know what crazy. Am I right? Yeah, okay. All right, well, if you're not entirely sure, just look to your left, look to your right, look behind you. Undoubtedly, you'll come across someone, okay? <laughs> then there are the resistors. These are the folks that really struggle with medical advice. They might have a long litany of, of reasons why they might have missed an appointment or, or missed an engagement. They, they, they will come up with, oh, I'm sorry, I was uh, late through going through the Dunkin' Donuts you know, drive through or, oh, I had tomorrow at one, not today at one. So they, they and, and in their mind, they're well justified. They feel as though there's nothing wrong with this. There could be some mental health issues. There could be addiction. There could be misunderstandings about the advice that you're giving them. For example, most people don't speak medical ease. So it is important when you're communicating with them to, I don't want to say dumb down, that would be really pejorative, but to speak a language that they understand. So how many here speak Spanish? Okay, so how many speak Italian? Or Portuguese, or any of the Romance languages? There are, there are similarities between Spanish, Italian, and French, but there are also nuances. So you can incidentally, or accidentally I should say, say something in one language which doesn't entirely translate to its brother or sister romance language. So it is important when communicating with these folks to be clear that you are speaking their tongue. So it might be you know, really not using medical terminology, for example, or using some other additional resource like an anatomy text or, or a picture or a drawing or a cartoon or something of that nature. These are not folks that you want to rush because that's the very excuse that they might use in the future. Oh, I didn't really understand because I know you were in a hurry. So you want to be very clear not to rush them because it's just going to feed into their fire a bit. These are folks that might need gentle reminders in following advice. And they might come back and say, nothing is helping me, doctor. Well, the first thing you one might want to ask is, well, how are the things that I recommended for you going? And I'll use an example from my own, my own practice. I do a lot of osteopathic treatment. 
Uh, and so one of the things that I do every single visit is I, as I demonstrate and go through uh, a therapeutic exercise routine that I want them to do. So when they come back and they say, my shoulder is still hurting, my knee is still hurting, okay, well show me, let, let me see how the exercises are going for you. High percentage of the time, oh yeah, ah, yeah, I, um, I, I'm, I'm not, yeah, I'm not really doing well with that. Okay. So let's review it, because the reason that I'm giving this to you is X, Y, and Z. I, I want you to have a more stable shoulder, I want you to increase the range of motion, and the same thing with diabetes. So let me see, let me see, your, uh, let me see your glucose meter. Oh, yeah, I forgot it, yeah. Okay, well, let's bring it back in, let's look at your blood sugar readings, and let's kind of collaborate on this. So really kind of uh, giving them the homework, and then somewhat grading it afterwards. The heaters, those are the heightened emotional folks. They might be defensive, they might be angry, they might be frightened. They might have some physical hand wringing, kind of restricted breathing, sullen face visual appearance, which could be caused by pain. It could be caused by impatience from having to wait, which in direct primary care, not a whole lot, there's not a whole lot of waiting, but they might have had bad experiences in the past with they've had to wait an hour to have a seven minute visit. So until they recognize that what you are offering is actually real, they might be carrying some of that baggage from their previous experience with a, with a healthcare facility or medical office and conveying that to you or transferring it to you. It is important to use reflective statements such as, I can understand why, I can understand why you might feel that way. Or I can understand how you might be frustrated with this. I can understand that it, that it feels as though you haven't been heard in the past kind of acknowledging their pain, their impatience, their, their fear, uh, et cetera, and then discussing how to move forward. Listen, I know you had a crappy experience at the Satanic Temple across town, uh, you know. Um, so we're gonna use that as a backdrop, and let's, let's figure out how we can move forward. You certainly do not want to fight fire with fire, because that is only going to re-engage them in their pathology. It's only going to reinforce their fear, their impatience, their doubt, et cetera. You want to fight their battle with kindness. So you want to kind of be like an Aikido or a ninja or something where they come at you and you simply deflect it, okay? And with a smile on your face. Also recognize with all of these, and I might mention it again earlier, you might not be the doctor for them. And that's okay. They might not be the patient for you and you might not be the doctor for them it's not about you, okay? Just might not be a good fit. All right, the manipulators, and this has nothing to do with osteopathic treatment. This has to do with more impulsive behavior to get what they want. They're playing off the guilt and emotions and your, your steadfast desire to help them. So they're going to feed and feed, you know, try and soak it off. You're trying to manipulate you for everything that you can get. They might be someone who, who can't reach you within 30 seconds, so then they call your nurse. And then 30 seconds later, they call the office staff. And then 30 seconds later, they call your wife. <laughs> okay? <laughs> these, these also might be the people that, despite having, so when I, when I go to the gym, and I'm, I'm kind of a jerk about this. I go to the gym, I get headphones in, and I ignore everybody. And I intentionally am somewhat rude with people who are patients of mine when I'm there. It doesn't take too long for me to say, you know what, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to be rude, I couldn't hear what you said, but I gotta, I gotta keep going because I don't wanna be late, you know? So you come up with some of the, but you, you do have to be rude somewhat and, and, and really try to rein in their manipulative behavior. There certainly could be some interesting personality disorders, perhaps would be a good way of saying it. Uh, perhaps a, some borderline, maybe even some bipolar. So it may provide you some clues to actually what is going on with them. You certainly do not want to give in to their pressures or their demands. You don't want to take the 30 second message to you and the 30 second message to the nurse and you, don't, you do not want to enable that behavior tomorrow or the week after. So what do we do? I gotta be honest with you, we ignore a lot of them. Yes, I got your message, I'm very sorry. I had my hand uh, in a pilonidal cyst, which is why it took me a little longer to get back to you, because I actually wanted to wash my hands before I ate my sandwich, okay? Uh, in Maine, one of the best excuses I love is, 
listen, you can get perfect cell reception off the coast of Costa Rica, but I can't get it next door. So I'm sorry, the cell, you know, the cell phone coverage, just, you know how it is. And they, oh, yeah, yeah, I know it happens all the time. Yeah, sorry for the delay. So you can use some of those, you can use some of those, some of those excuses, if you will, to really uh, re-educate them. Re I will get back to you, but you're very important to me, but so isn't going to the bathroom, okay? So I don't really want to call you from the bathroom, so just give me, give me, give me a couple of minutes. Avoiding heated discussions can be very difficult, particularly with their manipulative behavior, but it is, important to, to, it is important to avoid that at all possible. And as I mentioned with the previous uh, kind of archetype, you may not be the right doctor for them. And that may be someone that you say, be well. Okay? <laughs> be well. I have, a, I have a great colleague down the road who <laughs> more than happy to take care of you. The Smarties are one of the patients that, uh, one of the archetypes that uh, undoubtedly uh, will uh, cause a lot of angst for us. Uh, they could be true Smarties. They could be, pardon the French, but they could be the pain in the ass doctors or nurses. Or they could be uh, experts in Googleology where they, <laughs> where they do these online searches and come up with, oh, all of my symptoms fit into this categorization. So I did a little experiment with a patient one day and did an online test, and guess what? Found out I was expecting. <laughs> so um, they thought that was hilarious, and they've actually started a little fun because they want to see the delivery. I don't, I don't want to be there for that particular delivery. <clears throat> but the point is, is that, uh, and it's a good point of education where you can tell folks, listen, these, these search tools are intended to drive you toward what, they, what they're selling or purporting or pushing or whatever. Everybody passes, everybody scores 100% on an attention deficit score online. Everybody does. Everybody scores positive for adrenal fatigue. Everybody scores positive for subclinical hypothyroidism. Everybody scores, I mean, so the in line, chronic line, I, everybody scores positive for these things. So, you know, and it can be somewhat, it, it can be a difficult thing to break them from Google. So I keep a coffee cup in the office. It says, don't confuse my medical degree with your Google search. And I carry it around whether it's got coffee in it or not. Sometimes it has other libations in it, depending upon how the day is going. <laughs> but I keep that around. We've got a couple little signs that says, you know, ask your doctor, not Mark Zuckerberg. Okay. <laughs> At the same time, you, you want to balance their desire to become wiser. You want to acknowledge their strive for education because we all want well-educated patients. So trying to divert that energy toward appropriate education away from the forums, if you will, that are selling, I don't know, uh, you know extra virgin tea tree oil or something. But you want, to, you want to take that energy that they have to learn more and, and kind of mold it in a way that's much more collaborative for them. And there are certainly enough enigmatic conditions and syndromes that we all experience on a day-to-day -day basis that can make things very difficult. And it's okay to acknowledge I don't have a name for the condition that plagues you. We don't have a name for this. You have Jane Doe syndrome. That's what you have. You have your body, your anatomy, your physiology that's manifesting these constellation of symptoms. You don't need a Lyme test because your thumb hurts, okay? You don't have this. Maybe the reason why you're fatigued is because you don't sleep at night. Or maybe your, 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 your back is hurting because you're not doing anything but flicking the remote and walking to the, to the mailbox. Or maybe you're, having, maybe you're depressed and anxious because you've got some kind of past traumatic event that you've not adequately addressed. Or maybe you're anxious because you drink six pots of coffee a day. Or maybe you have heartburn because you eat Doritos all day long. I mean, just you know, kind of looking at some of those things and, and using some of the tools and the previous archetypes to, to collaborate with them, which can be challenging because they come in saying, no other doctor has been able to figure this out. Yeah, no other doctor's been able to figure this out, and then they move to a different archetype where I know you're going to figure it out because you're the best doctor in the world, okay? So 
<laughs> even though, even though I, have, I have divided these into rather distinct categories, patients will move back and forth depending upon their, you know, the phase of the moon for that matter. Speaking of that, Bark at the Moon is another good song by Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> They may, they're going to fluctuate back and forth depending upon what they're experiencing, depending upon their conditions, et cetera, et cetera. So the intent behind this is to just acknowledge that these patients exist, hopefully provide you some tools of how to interact with them and how to keep, a, keep an appropriate boundary. And I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Herder, who will, uh, who will crush it. I don't know, man. You're a tough act to follow. Ah, yeah, well, yeah. yeah. I thought about a try and, trying to figure out some way to introduce myself, and I said, well, you know, maybe, way I'll, maybe the way I'll introduce is by saying that people get Vance Lassie and I confused often, <laughs> but the difference is I'm the more handsome, articulate, and intelligent one <laughs> with more hair. Hey, will you put me in for okay. interview? <laughs> is Vance here? Wait a minute. I, I'm, yes, I'm running. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, folks. <laughs> All right, so really Jack is a tough act to follow, but when we um, decided to do this, we decided to split it up into kind of some uh, different takes on things. So this, we didn't know till yesterday what order we were gonna go in. I am Jen Herriter. I um, have a three and a half year old DPC practice in the middle of the country, Topeka, Kansas. I have no financial disclosures, and I also must acknowledge Vance Lassie, who helped me out with some memes for this talk, so. Um, when we decided to, when, when we talked with um, the organizers and specifically Lee Gross about whether we should present something like this, we kind of decided that we needed to kind of complain, but we wanted to do it in a funny way. So I'm gonna try to give you a minute on every slide to check out the memes, and then we'll kind of talk through this. All right, everybody got it. So. Um, I have a Star Wars loving husband and two sons who love Star Wars and so therefore by default I also love Star Wars and so while this really does not have anything to do with Star Wars this is a dark side and so one of the things that we do when we're at this conference and yesterday was full of it is we just rah rah the wonderful parts about direct primary care and there are so many of them and when we're trying to convince our colleagues like this is the thing you should do we just go crazy cheerleading for it. And then the difficulties come up and we all individually kind of think like, but this was supposed to be the best thing I ever did. And maybe it still is, but there's this stuff that's kind of hard and I don't know if that's okay. Am I not doing it right? Am I failing? Is anybody else having this? And so we're just bringing it to light. So Jack has already talked about the difficult patients and I'm gonna just talk about some difficult situations that we run into here, okay? So I am a nerd and I put some learning objectives on here. So the first one is that we just need to understand that direct primary care solves a lot of problems in healthcare. We heard about that yesterday. Those of us that are doing it know it, but it's still a really hard job. We need to understand that there are challenges that a mature DPC practice faces. And some of those things are uh, mistakes we make ourselves. And some of those things are just inherent to the job. And then we also need to understand that it's okay if direct primary care is not right for you. That's okay. All right, so this is kind of our guide slide here. So these are all the situations that we're gonna kind of go through here today, okay? All right, so here's our another, another meme. <laughs> so I'm on call, right? 24 seven, access, you have me from Orlando. In there in Kansas. So, um, you know, we do a lot of uh, talking about 24 seven, we're on call for you, we're here for you. And then it's like, but I need to get away. You know, we said we'll do this, and so now we have to do this. Um, I'm fortunate, I have some partners in my practice. I know that so many of you are just fighting this fight on your own. The whole 24 seven call thing is difficult. Um, and this is a situation I kind of refer to as my first world DPC problem where I have to look back and say, okay, what was my life like before? I was an employed physician for seven and a half years, and when I was on call, it was for 20,000 people in the whole practice. And to get a golden hour was amazing, let alone to get a golden day or a golden weekend. And so I think this whole 24 seven thing kind of floats over you, like any minute something could happen, someone might call, can I go to the pumpkin patch with my kids or am I just gonna get called in to do something? And it's almost like the longer it goes between you know, phone calls, the more it builds up and you think it's gonna happen any minute. And somehow, universally patients know when you sit down for dinner, 
when it's your kid's bedtime and when the pastor starts preaching at church. They just know. It's this sense that they have. But the thing about it is, in the reality of it, again, we have to take kind of stock and say, it's, it's okay. It's not that bad. And when it is that bad, it doesn't last. This one's one of my favorites. Can you guys read this small? <laughs> So Jack hit on this a little bit with some of his patient types in that in DPC, there's a lot of entitlement. And the hard part about this, I think, is that they're kind of right. So they're choosing to pay us, right? They're choosing to come out of a system that they understand better. They're choosing sometimes to pay us and insurance. They're working us into their family budget. And so there's this sense of like, well, I am paying for this good thing. And while we know myriad ways that we make things much better for them, sometimes they still want these extra things above and beyond. I had a patient recently who um, had to wait uh, about a week to get in for a very non-urgent thing that had been going on for a couple of months. And at our appointment, I could sense there was something going on. And finally, she just looked at me and she said, is this how things are now? And I said, what do you mean? And she said, am I going to have to wait? And I said, well, you know, your concern was not urgent. It's been ongoing, and it didn't seem like something that was going to be harmful, and we're busy with other things going on, you know, for patients who have more urgent things. Well, well I'm just going to have to really take a look and see if this is worth it. And I said, you know, you do that. You do that. <laughs> you go right ahead. I think the hardest part sometimes with this is we forget what the old system was like and then so do the patients, right? So when that lady leaves, I will just be ready for six months later, the email that says, could I come back? Because it's horrible out here. And you just say, well, maybe and maybe not. I don't know, I don't think about it. <laughs> All right, so this is what I call jungle medicine, right? So this dude is sweating bullets because he's like, I work in a DPC and my patients, half of them don't have two pennies to rub together and I know evidence-based gold standards. I took my boards. I know all the US Preventive Services Task Force recommendations and I can't do any of them. I have to do something that's affordable for this patient, right? And first do no harm in the midst of all of it. And I think there's so much creativity that gets to go into all of this. And I think this is where the benefit of having some um, groups that can talk together and just say, hey, listen, I have this patient. We have no resources whatsoever. Does anybody have a, an idea of what we can do here? I think this is where we can have a lot of support for each other. And then sometimes there's that moment where you just say to the patient, look, you're just going to have to save for six months before we can get that MRI because there's not any other option that I have for you. But I do feel like you know, there's a lot of a lot of different kind of energy that goes in sometimes to making the treatment plan for the patient because you can't just follow your XYZ treatment plan that you would have when you didn't have to worry about what, piece, what patient's resources were. So a little bit of jungle medicine. All right, all the hats, right? All the hats. So who's already got a DPC? Raise your hand. Okay, all right, so figuring being in this track, most people were. Um, so who's there by themselves most of the day? So you guys are really wearing all the hats. So I, my DPC is a little more mature, and I, we actually have five people that work full-time in our DPC all the time, and we still wear all these hats. So, you know, this, you know this. This is our day job, right? We answer the phone, and I love it still because the patients, you know, I say, Oasis Family Medicine, this is Dr. Heriter. Uh. <laughs> uh. I forgot, I'll call back, you know? <laughs> and, and I don't want that to happen, obviously, and at some point I know they'll get used to it, but they're still shocked by it. Um, and, you know, to some extent I love that, or even the specialists or the nurses, they say, I'm so sorry. No, I answer the phone, that's how it works. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to shock you. Um, you know, the, the plants are droopy, and you're like, sorry, that's the message we don't wanna give, like we kill stuff, so no, we gotta water the plants. Like nothing can not be okay, right? So we just have to do all of these things. 
my um, take on this is that I actually really like a lot of these extra things that I learned from my nurses, like drawing blood, doing EKGs, um, stuff that we didn't have a chance to learn before, and it's just an extra way, and patients adore it. As you guys probably know, like, I've never had a doctor draw my blood. Like, yeah, we suck at it, but um, <laughs> that's okay, right? Now I'm better. My nurse taught me, but I'm better, so. All right, this is Call Your Mama. So I hate when the text or the phone call says, well, normally I wouldn't call about something like this, but since I have your phone number, since I have your text, since I have your email address, I thought I would just ask you, what should I take for this headache? What do you think I should do about this tooth abscess like that my dentist already saw and is I'm scheduled for, you know, an extraction tomorrow or you know, what do you think about this thing I saw on TV? Don't call me. Some things are none of my business, right? Just thank you, but talk to your friends about this kind of stuff. Talk to your, like call your mom when your throat hurts for 5 minutes and if you don't know what to do like there are other people there's a whole row of stuff at the pharmacy when you get a cold and the pharmacist can tell you what to take so you don't always have to involve me this is the call your mama situation i i just sometimes it's too much i just want to say kind of just resist the urge people normally i wouldn't okay then be normal i don't it's okay it's okay Jack kind of touched on this a little bit, too. I am so glad that you're on vacation, patient, but I don't need to see pictures of it on my text messaging at 10 p.m. It's just, it's not okay, right? Um, there's this really inherent intimacy in DPC, and especially for those of you that are doing it by yourself, there's no escape. There are days where I just don't have it in me, and so I kind of avoid our front desk area um, because there's no barrier, right? If you're out there, no matter what you're up to, the patient walks in, oh, hey, while well, I've got you. No, you don't have me right now. I was doing something else, but you know, it, it's just, it's a very intimate kind of thing, and because I think we, invest in them so much, they also feel like they're invested in us. And so they want to know all the stuff about us. And they want us to know all this stuff about them too. But it's hard, right? Like it's super hard to have 500 best friends. They just have the one or two or whatever, but it, it's hard. And it's hard to have enough emotional energy to maintain all of this and support them through all of it. And so, you know, it's, it's I don't know, it's tough. Facebook, right? Who's Facebook friends with patients? It happens, right? Sometimes they're Facebook friends first and they become your patient, or sometimes you're actually accidentally like, confirm, oh, darn it. It's just sometimes there's just too much intermingling and it's really tough. So it's where those boundaries become really important for us. Okay, this is my mean slide. Mean memes. And I'm just gonna give you a minute to look over all of them. <laughs> Okay, the middle, is it too small? Okay, so it's these World War II era soldiers, all right? So the top bubble is the medic guy, and he says, don't worry, buddy, I've got some essential oils doing their work. <laughs> and the guy that's dying on the ground says, I know, I'm calm after you put that lavender on my feet. <laughs> so I found this definition of woo-woo, on Urban Dictionary that it's a slang term used to describe those who believe in phenomena that lack substantiated evidence to prove the claim of the phenomena. Okay, so I know that these things on here are controversial, and I know that there are people in this room, in our lives, in our worlds that are dedicated to their oils, and they're dedicated to their pursuit of eliminating leaky gut and looking for adrenal fatigue, and I get it, but the reality of it is what this is meant to demonstrate is that people misunderstand a lot of times that because we are on alternative payment model, we don't necessarily do alternative medications, medicines, treatment methods, and that kind of thing. And so it can be hard to sort through because a lot of times people come in and they, um, you know, they're, they're, for all the world, you have this sort of normal conversation. You think, okay, you understand evidence-based medicine. You understand what I do. You understand what I'm trained in. And then they come a little while later with their list that came from their combination chiropractor, naturopath, medical empath, dog groomer, I don't know. And you go, 
darn it, I guess my radar wasn't up and I didn't really understand what you wanted and you didn't understand what I wanted. And it, it creates a lot of conflict sometimes because people don't feel heard um, and they don't feel, they feel like somehow you're abandoning them in the midst of this thing that you didn't ever really agree to do. Um, and so I just, I think it presents a significant challenge when we use words like alternative or different. Um, sometimes there's a little blurring of the lines here, so. All right, somebody posted this on the DPC Women Facebook page, and it was a day that was particularly rough in our practice, and I was like, this is where I am today, for sure. <laughs> Do you guys feel this? Yes. Yeah. So we went to medical school, right? Who had practice management either in medical school or in residency? Okay, was it longer than like 10 hours? No, it was. Okay, so you had some extra benefit there. So I think my practice management um, part of my residency was 10 hours. It was like when the um, ophthalmologists are closed on Fridays, come over here and do some practice management. And so, and really, even if you had that, it was geared toward a traditional practice, right? So it doesn't even necessarily help you with the day to day running of a business of DPC. And there's this whole other part of it that, in addition to trying to be really good doctors, we are trying to be really good business people and entrepreneurs, and we don't really have necessarily the skills to do that. And so there again, that's where the support of this kind of group and um, you know, the DPC Alliance can really help with that kind of stuff. Cherry picking. Who gets accused of this? We get accused of this all the time, right? Cherry picking. So we joke all the time about the you know, patients that we've cherry picked. So I couldn't put a specific patient up here because there are so many people that we have in our practice that need us so badly. They are so sick. I have far sicker patients in my current DPC practice than I had in my traditional practice. And my argument against this whole cherry picking argument is that I actually think it's cherry picking to essentially require insurance to have access to a traditional model. So the very people that tell us we're cherry picking their patients away really need to be kissing our feet and shaking our hands because we are taking those patients who don't have access to them or who they don't really like or who are hard to take care of and they're finding us and we're taking really good care of them. So I think this whole thing is bunk. I'm tired of hearing it, but I know it's not going away. All right, so unfortunately, this was supposed to be my Star Wars uh, font here. What do we do about the dark side, right? So we've alluded to it a little bit. We have to talk about it. We can't, any of us, in an individual basis, feel like somehow we're failing because these things are happening to us, or somehow maybe we're not made for this because these things are happening for us. Again, it is okay if there's a, a bad fit and you're just not doing direct primary care well because it's not the right thing for you. But if it's just these normal things that happen because we're dealing with people and we're dealing with jobs that are hard and we're dealing with pathologies, we need to be able to talk about it. We have to remind ourselves that our job is really hard and that we have to be serious in taking care of patients. We have to feed our families, so we have to be serious in taking care of our businesses, and we have to make those things meet in the middle somewhere. We have to support each other in setting boundaries. I don't know um, that it... I didn't hear you say it necessarily, but we said it before, but Jack likes to say, like, no is a complete sentence, right? It's okay. No. No and no. But when you're first building your practice, I think the word that comes out before you even think about it is yes. Yes, whatever you need, I will do it. If you will come and be number 200 whatever, I will do it because I need patients. And then all of a sudden you have all these patients that you've said lots of yeses to and no needs to be said and it can be really difficult. And then we laugh. And that was hopefully the point of today is that even though you know, these are some serious and really difficult situations. We get a chance to laugh about them, so. Okay, that's what we have in terms of slides, and we are more than happy to entertain your questions at this point. <laughs> Turn this on. Hi. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm Corey Annis from Carboro, North Carolina. I've been in business for three years. And um, I actually have more of a statement than a comment. The graceful way that I've figured out how to set boundaries with my patients is I usually find a way to talk about somebody else and say, you know, I wanted to say to them, I'm your doctor, not your butler. 
and you know, and, and people get the message. You know, they understand that that you know, and, and I for some reason it is always I've always lucked up and had some other circumstance where I say, can you believe that somebody blah 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 that I can use with a patient who's asking too much. It's an excellent yeah. Yeah, that's a great way to handle it. No one has any questions? Or yeah. comments? No, don't even? give the mic to him. No. I'll throw you guys a softball. Please, please. Hey, come on. Oh. Again? <laughs> we'll give it to Dino after. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, a real challenge is that those people see your good ratings online. They hear about the good work that you do. They come in, and they've got um, either a non-diagnosis or a... Um, condition that's outside of the scope of your ability to diagnose and manage and they come for help and you run all the tests and you either find nothing and they're dissatisfied because you didn't find anything um, or um, they have something that's you know outside of your scope to manage and they're disappointed because you know what do you mean you can't do infusions of my you know let's say whatever rituximab or whatever right I don't do that, do you know? You know, one, one of the things... So, yeah, what do you, what do? You do? Yeah, I, so... I, I feel like I get in these lose-lose, and it's not... Yeah. It's not an overwhelming, but, you know, it's like 10 people every year who are coming through with just something you either can't find or can't treat. So one of, one of the things that I have found helpful uh, is that, you know, when you do this mammoth workup on these folks and you find no identifiable pathology, that... And I'm very honest, like, like, we can't figure out the name of this demon that's plaguing you, but I can definitely tell you what it's not. <laughs> so we don't do tests, and I tell folks, we don't, I don't order tests to diagnose something. That's what I have my clinical skills for. I use the test to either confirm, help with my differential, or to completely rule out something. So I can tell you with all assurance that you don't have cancer. You don't have a mass growing in your head. You don't have this, you don't have that. And not all the time, but many times, patients are just as reassured that you've ruled out what their unverbalized fear is than actually providing, uh, you know, providing a name. But there are still folks that are gonna be, and those are the folks that see the dog groomer down the road, and they, <laughs> and they see 100 different people because they want a name. Um, and, uh, but like I said, more times than not, they're very, they're very, help, they're very um, um, I don't want to say satisfied, but relieved that you know you don't have these ten things which are lethal. So, yeah. Um, I just I I'm Molly Rutherford. I've uh, been open for a little over three years, and um, I treat uh, I it's I'm family medicine, and then I'm also specialized in addiction medicine. So, I have a a somewhat busy practice due to the fact that I see my addicted patients pretty frequently. So I'm, I'm asking for advice on how to deal with the, the mom of five children who schedules an appointment for one of them and then wants all five seen when they, when they get there and don't really have the time. <laughs> have you ever said anything? I mean, so a lot of times what I will do is say, sure, yeah, we'll get everybody taken care of because what I don't want to do is ignore a concern first. So we do it this one time, and then I will say, you know, next time we would love it if we made sure we had plenty of time for everybody. So if you could just give us a heads up, yep. call us, let us know, send me an email. You know, if we need to trade visits, we can. If you've got one kid scheduled and we need to bring the other one in, that's fine. So saying, why did you have five kids is not appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> you can think it, definitely think it, but don't yeah. say it. Yeah. yeah. As, I, as I like to say, pick a different hobby. <laughs> oh, no. Hi, uh, Claude Ryan. I just had a, a recommendation um, for borderline personality patients. I don't know about you guys, but they are definitely my most challenging. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, I have an extended family member with a pretty, pretty presumed borderline personality disorder, which has helped a lot with dealing with my patients. Um, one thing, you know, I'm a pretty nice person. I think we probably mostly are, and especially women physicians, we tend to have a little bit, you know, too much empathy sometimes. And I have had to, and successfully so, become harsher with my borderline personality 
patients because they actually appreciate the boundaries better. So I don't answer the phone to them. I don't return their calls sometimes for 24 hours, especially if it's a non-urgent issue. Um, one book that I think really helped uh, my family deal with our extended family member is called Walking on Eggshells, which yes. I really thoroughly recommend you all read because we all get the borderline patients. So yeah. thank you. Yes. And borderline I'll, se I'll second that recommendation for the book. That's a, that's yeah. a great book. <laughs> What'd you say, Vance? <laughs> Maybe yours. Not anymore. <laughs> so I'm I'm cold. No, I'm Liz Eman, and um, I've been open for just about a year. And I have a really special patient population. I see transgender patients a lot who um, don't have their moms to call, um, or mm. even friends mm. um, or family that they can talk to, especially during the process. And so they rely on me as their mom and their sister and their mm like everything, and um, sometimes I can kind of set boundaries, but sometimes it's important for me to be that person too. Mm -hmm. And what I usually do is I kind of let them know like, you know, it's okay, you can t tell me about all of this stuff and we can talk about this in the office and we can even just have appointments where you tell me like what it was like going bra shopping for the first time, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but at some point you need to have your community be that person. And I just like, I put that out there, like it's in the room. like. I'm happy to do this for now, but you need to have your own community for that, because that's really not my job. And they usually understand that. Like, they're very, very understanding. And so, just for those people, because it seems really easy to set boundaries with some patients, but some patients, like, they don't have anybody else. And we have, I have time. And you know, I have an email address. They can send me emails. I don't have to respond to all of them. They just let me know, right? Yeah. So, just for some people who are like, I can't set boundaries. Well, you can set boundaries for the future, or you can help them find those resources where they don't actually need you so much anymore. So, That's just a great some tip. advice. Yeah, yeah it is yeah. A great. You know, one of the things that I will joke around with patients about is like, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll be that as much as I can, which <laughs> is actually kind of ironic. I say, you know, I, I could walk out of here and get into a, a car accident and die. So, I was recently yeah. in a car accident, <laughs> <laughs> and patients came back and said, yeah, we see what you're saying. Yeah, so it's important, you know, to try and be there for those folks. But it's also try important to try and facilitate. Not that you're not important, but we don't live forever, you know, and we might become incapacitated. So to try and give them some community specific to their, to their, whatever you know, life situation or medical condition or or resources that they need. Yeah, I think. Did you have a question, Vance? Yes, uh, no, four statements, quickly. First of all, awesome job, you guys. That's um, my brother, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> my, my twin what, brother. What, uh, what Jack said about being more intelligent, good looking, having better hair, all that is super true. <laughs> is super, he, he missed the part about where I'm more charming, uh, you know, masculine, friendly, and funny. And here's the other thing. Uh, uh, he did just have a crazy big car wreck like a week ago, destroyed his car got a bad concussion but he really is normal this is the way he usually is <laughs> he's trying to use that as an uh, excuse but no he really he, he really is okay I got a couple things really quick uh, well, this borderline stuff these people that wear us out you guys that's what the DPCA Alliance is all about because whenever you get out of the system you don't have five partners to commiserate with anymore people to bounce hard cases off you know what now you have you're on, you're on an island this isn't gonna bri bridge all of the islands and it's like a key to the doctor's lounge. We have each other when we have these challenging patients to rely on. How do you cope with this? How do you do this? Pat on the back, cry with you, laugh with you, whatever. And also, on the memes, I'm going to post all of them in a meme channel on the DPCA uh, Slack workspace. So one more reason to join up because you have access to all of them. All right. <laughs> can, I, can I say something real quick? I think two great comments that came up about, you know, number one, kind of finding a way, the very first person that commented, finding a way to subtly say to your patient, you know, this isn't okay by using another example, and then yours about, you know, support. I think what patients don't realize um, is, and I, I saw it or heard it best explained is, you know, they have this heavy weight, and so when they come and see you, they transfer that weight to you. But then you spend the day getting all this weight transferred to you, and so by the end of the day, you're just heavy, right? And we're not necessarily equipped very well to then transfer that weight elsewhere. It's a good argument that we should all be in therapy of some sort. But I think if you can help them kind of visualize that and say, I know you have this heavy weight, but I need you to go and have somebody who's skilled 
in how to deal with that. You know, when people go through learning how to be a certified counselor or a licensed clinical social worker, they learn skills about how to have some defenses about that. And we don't always have that. We just take it on and absorb it. And so I think it's good to be able to take it on initially and then say, we have to make a different plan because I can't keep absorbing all this weight or I'm going to sink. So. Mm -hmm. I think there's one back here. But yeah. Hey, guys. Um, so I want to be respectful of everybody in here. I realize we're all kind of a mosaic and everybody has their own, you know, beliefs and practice styles and things like that. Um, my wife is the first one to like spray essential oils in the back of my mouth when I'm half asleep and <laughs> practically cause chemical pneumonitis. A actually, actually, it's arsenic. Uh, oh. <laughs> Thank you for the clarification. Just, yeah. uh, but I get a lot of people who want to delay their vaccines mm -hmm. and they have no clue what they're talking about mm -hmm. from every standpoint. Mm -hmm. And they're they don't so know what they right. want they say, well, I might not want to do all of them. Wh which ones should I get? Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, wh well, which ones do you think are really necessary? And so, I mean, you could go on an infinite number of permutations how to give vaccines over a lifespan. So I don't know if any of you guys have a good strategy for that. I mean, I've, okay. <laughs> I can be loud, but maybe I'm not loud enough. Um, because I'm more into alternative medicine, and in my area, the non-vaxxers or delayed vaxxers have virtually no one to go to anymore because of the hospital systems. And honestly, they're easy money in that way, so I have a lot of them. Probably about half my um, 125 patients are delayed or non-vax. Um, I would say most of them can be counseled into a uh, scientifically appropriate schedule. I always tell them, um, keep to the intervals between the vaccines. If, it, if the research shows that you, they need to be given two months apart, they need to be given two months apart. If you're going to give it, get the most bang for your buck. Don't half-ass it. You know, yeah. This w one shot every six months business is not based on science. That's based on your emotional um, uh, issues with the vaccine. That's an emotional choice. That's not a scientific choice. And I would say the overwhelming majority of my patients who have trepidations about vaccines um, we get them caught up within a matter of a couple years. Now, I don't administer them. They have to go to the health department. So I'm like, it's more work for you. It's more needle sticks. Knock yourself out. But um, we'll come up with a schedule and say, okay, um, you want to do two at a time or three at a time. Okay, this is what you're going to do. You need to do these on this, these intervals, and these is how many times you're going to the health department. Go in with this schedule and tell them this is what I want. Now, our health department will do that. They see uninsured and insured patients for vaccines. They don't differentiate. That's not the same everywhere. And I'll tell them, you might get the crazy eye from them, but recognize they don't get a lot of requests like this. And if this is what you believe, you need to um, not be so thin-skinned about it. And they'll do it. So just insist that they do it. Um, so I don't, um, I document, I'll, I'll tell them, I don't make them sign anything about it because some people have a, barrier about signing a statement about vaccines. So I just say, okay, I'm just gonna document in the chart, like the first time that I see the kid or the first time I see the family, uh, this is why they're refusing. And overwhelmingly, the reason is they have um, concerns about the ingredients. Okay, we documented that, it's in there. So you're protected, you know, that way. Um, and so, but here's the thing, if we don't see them, they go to the chiropractors and the naturopaths and the whoever else's. And so I feel like it's a disservice to their health and to my profession to not take them on. Now, there are people who are kind of oh, on the fence with their newborn, and I've been able to encourage them to do the appropriate schedule, the standard CDC schedule. Um, but I, I had to learn the, all the like, um, you know, the, the catch up schedule really well to be able to counsel them about this. So I had to do my own learning. Um, but it can be done. I encourage folks to do it because um, they will be very loyal, very, very loyal. Because you understood them, you met them where they were, and guess what? The next time that something comes up where they're like, oh, on the fence, they're more likely to trust you about it. So I find it to be a trust building thing. Thank you. Oh. 
Um, Adriana Rouse from Michigan. Uh, I want to have a comment about that heavy weight that patients are transferring to us. One of my attendings in residency, one of my attendings in residency told me that is like uh, having a zoo. Patients will bring the monkeys to you, you just pet them and give them back. Don't take them home. <laughs> I didn't do anything. It was you. I saw Rebecca, and I think I, it was Jessica. Did you have your hand up, too? Oh. Okay. Here, you want this one, Jessica? Uh. Hi, I'm Heidi Braun from uh, Savannah, Georgia. Um, internist, have been in, had my DPC practice for one and a half years now. Just a quick comment on the vaccines. I'm guessing you're talking about children, probably, which, you know, I don't, I don't treat. But uh, on the flu vaccine, a uh, local pulmonologist just made a funny comment on, uh, on Facebook the other day. He said, you know, there are two cases of Ebola in the United States and everybody freaks out, yet 80,000 people died of the flu last year and you still don't get the flu vaccine? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's been waiting. Rebecca's been waiting a bit. Now, Hi, Rebe Rebecca we've Bernard. given you the mic, so you're going to have to say your statement and, and question and, in English. Yeah. Yes, and then in Portuguese. Spanish. And Portuguese. And después, and después, después, cualquier persona. Que, no. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Rebecca Bernard. I'm talking in the next lecture about, thank you for a great lecture. It'll hopefully build on some of these principles of how to use psychology. I believe that psychology uh, is so essential that everybody should be in therapy, if not for yourself, so that you can learn the tools to use on your patients. I always say the people that really need to go to therapy won't go, and that's why we have to. So one of the things that we've done in our practice is we've actually brought in a psychologist into our DPC practice. It was remarkably easy to find her. I went on Indeed.com. I put an ad, I said, I'm looking for a therapist or a psychologist that will come once a week. I'm only gonna pay you $50 a person, but there's minimal documentation. I had a huge outpouring of people that were interested. I interviewed some, I picked the one that seemed the best. She's been with us for a year. She comes once a week, we charge the patient $60 a session. And this is so awesome for these patients that are so, so challenging and you don't have time to play psychologist and we have this much skills, but we need um, much more. So um, consider bringing in a psychologist into your practice. I highly recommend it. We've, we've, we've got about five minutes, uh, about four minutes left, and the, the mafia uh, boss has already given me the, the, the hand, so. I'm Whitney Pack. I'm a pediatrician. I own a DPC in Colorado. Just for the vaccine question, um, I have been starting to do motivational interviewing with my patients, and it's extremely effective. So if you don't, don't know anything about motion, uh, motivational interviewing, which I did not, really look into it. It is, it is totally different than the approach I was taking, which I thought was right. So um, really look into that because it helps you have a really respectful, open dialogue. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> oh, great segue. So, oh. last, last so on last the back. On the vaccine issue, um, I kind of go back to my experience. I grew up in a different country. I grew up in Nigeria, and I actually experienced some of the vaccine preventable diseases as a child myself and saw my friends experiencing these. And so I think sometimes the difficulty is we live in a first world where a lot of people have never seen what happens when a kid gets chickenpox and dies, or they get polio, or they get the flu and die because they hear about it, but they don't see it themselves. And I think sometimes bringing that reality back to them that, yes, you don't see it now, you don't think it's important now, but here are pictures of what it looks like when you see an Amish kid who's two-year-old and dies from hip. Those are realities for a lot of people in other countries, and we have the blessing of not seeing that, but that will come back if we don't continue what we do. Um, I actually had a question for Dr. Bernard. I was curious about the uh, credentials of your counselor, a psychologist, PhD, uh, medical social worker, uh, what? I'm sorry. 
Um, that's an excellent question. I'm a big believer in psychologists that are real psychologists. Uh, that's not always uh, an option because maybe you can't find one to work with. So our person is a PhD, but her license is under a licensed mental health counselor. Uh, how, I prefer psychology whenever you can, although I do think there are some very skilled professionals that are not necessarily with that degree. But uh, just like I think physicians have a certain skill set compared to other uh, non-physician professionals, I do prefer for psychologists whenever possible. Hi, this one. Okay, um, so I'm Penny. My husband's a physician. I'm the office manager. What I need to know is how you handle no-shows. They're already members. Do we you charge do the them? Dance do we of not? Joy. See, I get all kinds of answers. <laughs> Listen. And, and we'll end on that note. So I deal with no-shows by, um, well, some things that they've already mentioned up back, but uh, Clash of Clans, uh, Boom Beach, uh, Clash Royale. Uh, honestly, I live for no-shows sometimes. <laughs> no. Okay, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. Right. And at least from my perspective, when I've got a full morning of pre-booked appointments and the 9.30 and the 11.30 don't show up, I'm perfectly happy with that, except a patient call and asks for a full morning appointment, and I didn't have it. Yeah. And so I start fasting on the end of the day. And for me, that's not a good thing. And I'm not going to go home early. I don't like that either. So I still don't even have an official policy on it, but I'm toyed with the idea of saying, look, if you don't show up and you didn't even call or text, Jen? Yeah, I mean, you just look at it as time to catch up. So we don't ever let them ride. We always yeah. contact that patient. Number one, we couch it in the terms of we're concerned for your welfare, making sure you're okay. And then second of all, you know, we did reserve this spot for you. And so they're so remorseful mostly. And then they don't usually do it again. The serial repeaters, I think... Um, Jeff, as far as those patients, that's maybe who you need to come up with something to say. You know, we're you're really taking up a lot of time that you're not using, and somebody else could use it. So, so, how about a big round of applause for our panelists here today?